Good morning. This is Rebecca Emerling from the Office of Educator Talent with the Michigan Department of Education. And we'd like to thank you for joining us this morning to talk a little bit about educator evaluation and um, specifically to talk a little bit about combining student growth and performance data for summative evaluation. Today in the room with me, I have um, Brian Lloyd, who is our education research consultant. And specifically, he spends a lot of time supporting and developing guidance for student growth um, throughout the state of Michigan. And also, um, Martin Snitchen is here in the room to help support us through the webinar. And he'll be helping us out with um, the Q&A piece. So our goals for this conversation today are to briefly touch on the relevant legislation that speaks to the topic of um, the end of year evaluation and the summative evaluation and how to go about um, combining that um, student growth piece and that uh, performance rating piece in compliance with the law. We are going to talk a little bit about the principal survey data. And also, um, we're going to share some different approaches that we've encountered as um, we've worked throughout the state this year. And um, some thoughts that we have here in the office about how districts may approach um, combining student growth and performance data for the end of year summative evaluation. Um, one last time, I want to mention at the bottom right-hand side of your screen, you should see a quick poll. And if you would please take a moment and participate in that poll, just indicating which of the evaluation systems um, your district is currently using. And if you are not using one of the four state-approved models, that's OK. But just if you could click Other. Um, and then also wanted to draw your attention to the bottom left-hand side of your screen where there is a file downloadable, um, which is our PDF file of the presentation deck today. Um, I know some people appreciate having the opportunity to print that and, and make notes on that. So we tried to make that available for you. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up email at the end of our um, presentation today. And that will include the PDF file of our deck, as well as the recording from today's session and um, our Q&A with some expanded answers if we're not able to um, expand fully on a question and answer today. So this webinar session was not in our original uh, series. We had not planned on, um, we hadn't actually thought of the need for addressing this topic necessarily until we started receiving feedback from our constituents out in the field. And it became pretty evident to us that this is an area that people really could use some support in. And so um, some examples of um, feedback that we've received are um, some pieces from our regional liaisons as they work with districts out in the field. Um, we've had conversations with education law representatives and superintendents. And we've also had um, some really good conversations with teachers and teacher union representatives around this very topic. So um, today we'd like to um, seek a little feedback from you around this topic. And we would like to provide some assistance to all of you out in the field on this and other educator evaluation issues. So we want to start today by just um, acknowledging that there are a number of legislative pieces 
directly informing or in some way impacting educator evaluation in the state of Michigan. And for the purposes of our session today, I just wanted to highlight a few of the relevant key points from Section 1249. Um, Section 1249 clearly indicates that um, the performance evaluation system must include an annual year-end evaluation for all teachers. It also um, delineates that 25% of the annual year-end evaluation shall be based on student growth and assessment data in 16-17 uh, and 17 18 and that that percentage will increase to 40% in 18 19 um, Additionally, a teacher's annual year-end evaluation that is not based on uh, student growth and assessment data shall be based primarily on a teacher's performance as, as measured by the evaluation tool developed or adopted by the school district, intermediate, or public school academy. And finally, the portion of a teacher's evaluation not measured using student growth and assessment data as described in subparagraph I or using the evaluation tool developed or adopted by the school district, intermediate school district, or public school academy shall incorporate criteria enumerated in section 1248 that are not otherwise evaluated under subparagraph uh, 1 or 3. So in layman's terms, um, that's a whole lot of legal speak. So in layman's terms, um, the law speaks to the requirement for an annual year-end evaluation for every teacher. And it speaks to the fact that 25% of that end-of-year evaluation must be based on student growth and assessment data, and that the remaining 75% must be based on the performance rubric and additional factors. We would be remiss to not talk about the fact that um, Michigan is a state that relegates a lot of decision making to local control. Um, PA 173 requires school districts, ISDs, and PSAs to consider student growth data as a specific percentage of a teacher's evaluation. But what it does not do is it does not define the process, formula, or weighting of additional factors outside of the required student growth and teacher performance percentages. So as a, as a result, school districts, ISDs, and PSAs have discretion regarding the weight to give a teacher's performance and the criteria listed in Section 1248. That being said, we do feel that it's in everyone's best interest if your protocols, processes, and assumptions are applied consistently and transparently across all schools in your district and ultimately um, formalized through board policy and delineated clearly through administrative guidance. I'm going to hand the microphone over to Brian Lloyd so that he can talk with you a little bit about the educator evaluation survey um, that was delivered earlier this spring to principals throughout the state. Brian? Thank you, Thank you Rebecca. Uh, we sent out, um, Michigan Department of Education, Office of Educator Talent, sent out a survey um, on April 14th to 3,553 school-based principals and assistant principals across the state. The purpose of, of the survey was to better understand how schools and school districts are currently combining teacher practice and student growth data to determine uh, effectiveness ratings for teacher evaluations across the state. We also wanted to know how student growth data is being aggregated to determine effectiveness ratings for administrator evaluations across the state. And finally, we also wanted to know the methods that are currently being used across the state to determine administrator effectiveness ratings from aggregated student growth data. So we sent this survey out 
Um, and we asked the following questions within the survey. Um, we asked for a name, but uh, that was an optional response, and that was indicated as such. We asked whether the recipient was a school-based principal or assistant principal, um, and whether they evaluated teachers. Um, an answer to no of either of those questions would uh, bring you to the end of the survey. Um, the recipient would then be asked to please indicate the method that uh, their school is currently using to, com to combine teacher practice and student growth data into an overall effectiveness rating. And three choices were provided. And uh, the first choice was calculation, the second choice was rubric, and the third choice was other. And if other was chosen, then um, an extend, uh, a response was then provided uh, so that you could provide a, an extended response to describe what that other uh, method was. Um, then for, uh, for each of those three different methods that would be chosen, then a next question would come up which would ask to please describe in detail the, that method that, that was chosen. Uh, then uh, the next two questions after that were to describe how student growth is aggregated to determine uh, your own being the principal's own effectiveness rating and to please describe the method used to determine uh, your own or the principal's own overall effectiveness rating from aggregated student growth data. So we received, um, out of the 3,553 survey uh, uh, that we sent out, individuals that we sent to the survey out to, um, we received 220 responses, or 6.2% of recipients responded to the survey. Um, which in April, which is a very, very busy time of year for, for, for everybody, um, it was actually surpassed a little bit the, the, uh, the expectations they had for responses. Um, so we had 220 responses to the survey. The, this webinar session, um, the intended purpose of this webinar session is in response to, is really speaking to that first item, the first, um, the, the, that first question that we asked after, are you, a, uh, do you evaluate, um, that uh, requested detailed information on the method that is currently used to combine teacher practice and student growth data into an overall effectiveness rating. Um, so I'm going to, I'm, I'm really, I'm only going to talk through the responses of the first question. The, the other two questions yielded very good information too, and, and we'll be using that information uh, at a later date and disseminating that information. But the, but the survey responses that described in detail the method uh, to, uh, to combine teacher practice and student growth data into an overall effectiveness rating score, uh, uh, those responses uh, were categorized, and we're going to talk a little bit about that in a, in a, in a couple slides. Um, we received, out of the 220 responses that we received, um, 77 responses, or 35 percent of the total, indicated that a calculation method was used to combine student growth and teacher practice data, teacher performance data. Um, 99, 99 responses, or 45 percent of responses, indicated that a rubric was used to combine student growth and teacher practice, teacher performance and 44 responses, or 20% of the total responses, indicated other, which, as going th when you went through the responses, primarily indicate uh, the the responders typically uh, indicated that other was a combination of calculation and rubric. And I would also say too that um, as going through the responses, there were many calculation. There were many who indicated calculation. That also indicated that a rubric was part of the, was part of their decision making process uh, and their determination process. And a rubric as well said, "Okay, we'll use a rubric, and then we use a calculation." So there was there was within the narrative of the responses some some mixing of methods that um, that were that were described. So um, the categorization of uh, the responses to methods that are being used across the state for 
uh, determination of an overall effectiveness rating. Um, there, the were, were put into a, they, they were put in these responses were put in a number of different categories. Um, Seventy six responses or thirty four point five percent total responses indicated uh, a, a reference to uh, a resource or a tool only. Uh, uh, so that the, the question, please describe in detail the method that you use using calculation or other or rubric. Um, the response would say, for uh, an example response of this category would be Danielson or Danielson framework or another an, another uh, another tool. So um, that was some, that was 34.5 percent of responses. Um, 56 responses, or 25.5 percent, um, indicated that rubric or calculation was mentioned, but was not mentioned in any detail. So an example of the, this uh, category would be rubric for calculation with final rating by calculation. Um, that would probably be an indication of an other response. Um, 24 uh, responders, or um, about 11 percent of responders, indicated a reference only to 75 percent and 25 percent or some other percentage, like 60-40. Um, so, for example, an example response of this category would be 75 percent observations in classroom and 25 percent student growth. Um, three percent or three total responders uh, indicated that um, did not mention student growth at all within their response. Um, two uh, indicated that uh, included reference to state percentage for their description. So Marzana framework for instructional practices apply the same rubric to evidences teachers share on student growth, then compute it to state requirements. Be an example of that category. Then uh, 13 responders, um, about 6 percent. Um, uh, that category was student growth model or data uh, was on, mentioned only. So only the student growth model or, data, or student growth data or, or assessment data uh, was mentioned uh, with no teacher practice data being mentioned. So an example of this would be teachers use pre and post tests to determine student growth. The resulting percentage is input into a rubric, which results in a scaled result of effective, et cetera. Um, then the next category would be uh, eight responses um, w indicated that uh, this, the method for combining student growth and teacher uh, practice performance uh, was not yet determined. They didn't know how it was done or it was at the administrator's discretion. So that was 3.6 percent response. Then 24 responses um, were categorized as describes percentage breakdown of student growth and teacher practice with some component detail. An example of this is uh, we give two ratings, one based on teacher practice using the Danielson framework, one based on student growth data. These two ratings are then given a numerical value of one through four, put into a formula, uh, 0.75 times practice rating plus 0.25 times data rating, this score is applied to a range of values that produce an overall rating. So 11 percent um, would be, around 11 percent would be uh, indi indicative of a, of a description of that, uh, of that type of response. Uh, then eight responses were too vague to categorize. An example of that would be the response of combination. Um, and then list data sets only. We use NWA map for the fall, winter, and spring. NWA provides calculation for the report. So that was 2.7 percent of our responses. So in summary of the survey results, um, the, the categories themselves um, were not indicative of practice efficacy. So just because the responder said, Danielson, a 5D plus, uh, and didn't pr it didn't provide a lot of detail. It doesn't mean that one practice that that that, that practice was any better or worse than uh, w than a survey responder who provided um, a significant amount of detail 
on how the combination the combination methods that they provided. So there's not these aren't value; these are just nominal. Um, the and the but the non-representative sampling of uh, voluntarily provided responses uh, really indicated that um, that people in the field really need assistance uh, with combining teacher practice and student growth data that's consistent with our current legislation, which is consistent with 380-1249. Um, there were, within the um, survey, a very wide variety of responses, um, to the point where I would say I'm, I was a, a bit surprised at um, how different the practices are um, across the state. Um, uh, for combining uh, teacher practice and student growth. Um, the most common, I, although, although there was a very wide variety of responses, the, the most common response of the more uh, defined and detailed responses indicated that um, the use of frameworks to determine a one through four teacher practice rating, which was then calculated with a one through four uh, student growth rating at, at uh, and those ratings were then um, ca uh, ca calculated to uh, produce a specified weighted uh, at, were calculated using a specified weighting percentage. So one through four teacher practice score, one through four um, uh, student growth score rating. Um, and then multiply both of those times 0.75 for teacher practice, 0.25 for student growth. And then that number was then rounded to uh, derive a single overall effectiveness rating. Uh, so that was, that was probably the majority, that, the, probably, that was the majority of responses of, the, uh, of those who had, had, had provided enough definition to be able to discern um, their, their method for com uh, combining teacher practice and student growth. Um, so that, that segues into, um, you know, uh, providing guidance for um, educator practice for combining teacher practice and student growth data. Um, the, and the possible approaches that can be taken, there isn't any single one approach that, can, that, that, ha that has to be taken, it's certainly not mandated, um, to combining teacher practice and student growth data. Um, but uh, but it's I think it's it's good to talk about uh, and provide uh, if people do have uh, either concerns or uh, questions or um, you know have need for uh, methods that's it's a good conversation to have um, and I think I'm gonna um, uh, let uh, Rebecca now talk a little bit about some important points. Thank you, Brian. So in this conversation, it, it's very important that we acknowledge up front that um, there are some really significant implications around this issue. Determining a professional's overall efficacy rating certainly has the potential for substantial impact. Efficacy ratings have implications for professional certification, for layoff, recall, and dismissal. And although the purpose for implementing a research-based, rigorous, transparent evaluation system is to support and facilitate continuous improvement, the state of Michigan's laws have tied very weighty personnel decisions to the overall efficacy rating. We feel that that truth um, only elevates the importance of implementation of a strong system one which is transparent, consistent, and highly defensible. Um, so many of these things, um, many of these protocols, policies, they need to be addressed at the local level with board policy. The law gives districts the right to make critical decisions to align any evaluation model to local priorities. The system needs to be prioritized and treated with the highest level of intentionality in the planning stages and through the implementation stages. When the evaluation system 
is considered with that level of intentionality, it can be the catalyst for systems alignment, and it can facilitate authentic professional growth, leading to significant improved student outcomes. There's a large body of research supporting the fact that authentic systems change takes time. And so our office, as we consult with districts across the state, hold those foundational truths as the centerpiece for all of our work. That being established, um, we're going to move into sharing a resource. Um, Brian's going to share a resource that we're working on here in the Office of Educator Talent, which is currently a conceptual model. And in our office, we're considering ways that we can support districts in accurately, consistently, and fairly calculating overall efficacy ratings. In the model we're going to share, we created a fictitious framework model based on four overarching domains or dimensions. We placed five indicators or performance measures within each domain purely for the purposes of demonstrating how districts may approach the calculation of a performance rubric score. We then created a calculator through which student growth and performance rating data can be combined to arrive at a final overall um, rating. We acknowledge this model does not address every confounding factor existing out there. In particular, we have not explicitly addressed the 1248 additional factors in this fictitious model. One of the major reasons we wanted to engage in this session today with all of you is to solicit feedback and make a request for earnest thought partners around this entire topic. We would like to gauge the appetite for the creation of resources such as this calculator and what stakeholders would need those resources to look like in order to best meet their needs. We are genuinely looking for feedback on how districts are currently approaching the 1248 additional factors, and we'd love to learn from all of you what is current practice, where the gaps may be, and how we can best help districts close those gaps to ensure the most efficacious implementation of their educator evaluation systems. Brian? Thank you, Rebecca. OK, I'm going to pull up a, I, I'm going to pull up a tool uh, that was developed, a resource that was developed to provide assistance uh, for the um, for the combination of student growth and teacher practice data. So as Rebecca indicated, the uh, this uh, assistance resource is a fictitious assistance resource. This is not developed for any of the current uh, state approved frameworks. Uh, this is a um, uh, this is a framework that's that's listed here for domain scoring or de domain slash dimension scoring as uh, four domains slash dimension dimensions with five indicators each. Um, so um, in this fictitious framework, uh, the educator could um, list the teacher, um, the teacher's name, um, the observation date, the evaluator, um, and uh, the evaluator's name, the end of the year meeting date, um, and then um, score the indicators using uh, the efficacy rubric for three, two, one, depending on the the, uh, the indicator. Um, and so uh, enter in a one through four score for each indicator. Um, the educator could uh, choose from differing scoring options. In this fictitious um, uh, framework, we would we choose from either uh, total points, which would total up the number of uh, the points from each indicator, um, or uh, choose an average of ratings, which would average the one through four uh, scores for each indicator and provide an average of uh, for each dimension slash domain. The default is would be the sum of the total points for each indicator's domain. So that what this uh, tab does is simply 
um, total the indicator uh, ratings for each domain in this fictitious framework. So then the, uh, then, uh, the educator would click on the effectiveness rating calculator. And again, this is just developed to provide uh, you know, some conceptualization around how this, uh, how this could be done. Um, this isn't an MDE tool. This isn't, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, this is just uh, a way to help, to help us think about this. Um, so the teacher's name and the evaluator's name would carry over from the previous page. Um, the scores would be carried over from that previous domain scoring tab um, and would be entered here. Now, some frameworks uh, provide guidance for, and, and, Re and Rebecca had talked earlier about, the uh, the the potential for weighting each domain. So, if a district uh, had a priority for a domain dim slash dimension number four, I cut out. Okay. Okay, so it looks like Brian's microphone may have cut out. We're going to reset the audio bridge um, so everyone can hear him. Just give us one moment to do that, please. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. Um, Okay, I'm going to stop sharing and then share again. Okay, I uh, apologize for that interruption. Um, that's uh, the, the the perils of technology, unfortunately. Um, so uh, as I was as I was saying, the um, you can uh, wait. Uh, uh, certain domains depending on district or uh, public school academy priority. Um, so in this case, we would um, weight fictitious domain slash dimension number three, um, which would uh, change the number of possible points that uh, an educator could receive. Then um, what that would do is uh, uh, change the potential threshold scores for what would be highly effective, effective, minimally effective, and ineffective. Um, so what was done uh, was to calculate um, a highly effective would be um, what would essentially be an average of 3.5, uh, a, a rating of 3.5 or higher, um, assume, assuming you use either the total calculation or the average of, um, of indicator uh, scores. Uh, effective rating would indicate, a, it would uses a calculation that indicates 2.5, a rating of 2.5 or above uh, would be used. Um, minimally effective, 1.5 and above, and ineffective, uh, 1.49 or, or below. Um, so uh, as the ratings are Weight either uh, cha either change themselves or the scores change themselves or the weighting has changed. The number of possible points are ch uh, changed, so uh, which causes a change in the suggested threshold scores. And these threshold scores are suggested are suggestions only. Um, so you can either the educator or the uh, you know in collaboration with teachers and making sure that you have a transparent me a method and that's consistent with uh, with all of your with all of your educators um, you uh, can either set your own or you can follow the the thresh the thresholds that uh, that are, are automatically calculated the the changing of these um, of these manually entered um, threshold scores then um, would alter the calculation uh, that is um, that is referencing these manually entered uh, uh, threshold scores. So um, if uh, 
if that's altered, you can see the effect that that can have on the teacher performance range score. Um, and if the thresholds are followed, you can see how that, what effect that that would have. So that's a way to automate the calculation of the teacher performance rating score. Um, then student growth rating scores. Um, so you can, uh, using this resource, you can enter in uh, up to uh, from one all the way up to five different student growth rating scores. So if you're using SLOs, if you have two, this is assuming two SLOs, if you're using a SLO with a, st uh, a static assessment that's applied to all teachers, for example, or, um, you know, there's a lot of different, and, and this, there isn't space within this, um, within this webinar to be able to address all of them, and we have previous webinars that have addressed uh, student growth uh, methodology. Um, uh, and, and, the, and the ability to calculate student growth rating scores. So, but using that information, uh, you can put up to one, um, you know, one SLO that uses multiple measures um, or um, d different different rating scores that would, um, you know, that would uh, that would then combine your um, your student growth data. So putting in multiple student growth measures or one student growth rating, or multiple student growth ratings, or or multiple student growth rating, you would have you would uh, automatically calculate an average student growth rating score. Um, so this tool also um, will provide you with different cal calculations consistent with 380-1249, depending on. Uh, depending on the year that you have inputted. So 2018-19 would automatically calculate um, uh, student, uh, would automatically calculate uh, state assessment data in the form of student growth percentiles for tested grades and subjects. That uh, would get into a, a subject that uh, would take an entire another webinar to be able to describe. So we're, we're going to, um, just demonstrate right now the teacher practice or the the 2017-18 weighting and the use of local local student growth rating scores to be able to calculate. But just know that uh, using this example um, uh, would uh, using this example resource would provide uh, the capability of weighting in student growth percentile rating scores to provide. Um, uh, state assessment, student growth ratings, and factor that into your overall um, uh, overall effectiveness rating score. So uh, then down at the bottom of this resource is um, provides uh, automated calculation. So this is not inputable. It takes all of the input that you've already provided. Um, and it weights the teacher practice score. So uh, it, it, depending on the year that you've selected, if you've selected 2018-19, it would weight your teacher practice score at 0.6. Um, for the for the next school year, it would automatically weight it at 0.75. This is something that you know, if you wanted to use a different percentage, it's above. Um, uh, that's different than that. That's that's something that could be done. But um, but it's when when in doubt, it's always good to follow follow the follow the law, follow the legislation of, of uh, recommended uh, uh, percentages. So 2017-18, uh, 0.75 would be used um, and weighted, uh, and would weight that 3.0 pre already determined score that was, that was determined above. Uh, then the uh, student growth rating score, which was averaged at a 3.5, would be weighted, and then because we have uh, we've indicated 2017-18 is the current is the school year, uh, that score is weighted uh, at 0.25. Uh, those weighted scores are then added together to uh, to calculate a sum of weighted effectiveness rating. So then that sum of weighted effectiveness rating would be rounded so that 3.5 and above would indicate a four uh, rating score, a highly effective. 2.5 to 3.49 would indicate uh, a, uh, a an effective score. 1.5 to 2.49 would indicate a, a minimally effective, um, and a below 1.49 or below would indicate a 
uh, 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 an overall effective score of 1. So hopefully this provides some um, helpful way to conceptualize the um, how to calculate in a clear and transparent uh, way that is fair um, uh, an overall effectiveness rating. Um, in, in conversations that we've had with uh, with regional liaisons, the, the, some in, input that we got from the survey, talking with people in the field, talking with a lot of different people, um, where um, we, when um, educator evaluations. Um, have a very negative result, or when there is a where there is a lot of conflict, it's it's almost always in our conversations when a, when there isn't transparency with how the rating score is derived, so um, or or even just confusion around where the how the rating score was 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 derived. So have, pro providing a method that provides transparency and is and is understandable to the people who are who are um, providing the scores and are calculating the scores, and once and all who are receiving these scores can be very important. Um, now, as Rebecca had talked about before, this resource does not take into um, account the 1248 um, additional factors. So, um, uh, uh, so we would welcome your input, and if if you could, um, in our, the Q&A section um, within the webinar, number one, um, if you could describe how, what methods you are currently using to take those 1248 consider additional factors into consideration how, and how they are affecting your overall effectiveness rating score. Um, uh, so that's number one. And number two, it, how would, what would your be, ideal be if you if you were an educator, if you were um, if you were a teacher um, uh, in in your current role, what would your ideal method be for taking those uh, additional factors into consideration for how they would affect, how they would impact the overall effective rating score? Because we would we would love to uh, get input from. Uh, from all of you for um, how this is number one being done and number two how uh, how people would like it to be done um, and what would be what is considered ideal um, there's a lot of different ways that, that it could be factored into uh, the uh, determination of the overall effectiveness rating so um, uh, there there isn't one way there wouldn't be one way um, and it would really be a determination. It, it would be district by district, to be depending on the needs of the district and uh, the relationships between uh, uh, teachers, administrators, um, and priorities of the districts. So, um, but and and also, I would also like to know, or we would also like to know, uh, Office of Educator Talent would like to know, would this a resource like this that would that could be provided by MDE uh, for districts that are having difficulties uh, uh, providing consistency and clarity and transparency, um, or would like a tool like this. So, if you could indicate also within the Q and A, um, would you want this? Would you want um, uh, MDE to um, to send you a copy that's uh, that would help you with uh, providing this kind of information using your framework. Um, that information would be very, very helpful for us um, because it's it's one thing to prevent uh, to uh, to provide a proof of concept, but it's a it is another to uh, to provide a tool um, that uh, delineates scoring for uh, calculating an overall effectiveness rating score. So that information, if you could provide that information, that'd be very, very helpful for us. For um, for making some decisions around that as well. Okay. Let me pull. I am pulling up the presentation again. 
And I'll allow, I, I'll allow some time for uh, for responding to. And um, I've heard there's a couple questions. Um, I'm going to jump in for one second here. And we're going to switch the view here and, um, and give you guys an opportunity to respond to a couple more polls at the bottom of your screen on the left. Um, we'd love for you to give us an idea of what mechanism your district uses to derive a professional practice score. Um, and it, it just gives us some really good information as we're thinking about um, how we can support you. And then also, um, on the right-hand side at the bottom of the screen, we're, we'd love to know if your district would have um, any desire to have a calculator tool combining professional practice and student growth. And we've kind of delineated um, our thoughts there in four different options. But um, if those options don't meet your, your needs or if they don't accurately reflect um, where you're coming from, um, please don't hesitate to indicate that in the Q&A. Um, we will take some time um, together here in the office to go through every question on the Q&A and make sure that we're really thoughtful about responding to those in our expanded uh, Q&A document. And then, um, obviously, of course, if there is an individual who poses a question um, that warrants further discussion, we will um, contact that individual and make sure that we continue that um, dialogue with them. Um, so Brian did ask that if, if you could please, in the Q&A, um, indicate how your district is approaching the 1248 factors. Um, that would be wonderful, but if it's too much to enter into a Q&A and you would much rather provide um, us with information through email format, um, please email either me or Brian and we will, um, again, we'll put our heads together here in the office and make sure that um, we consider that in a really thoughtful way and communicate back with you. Um, up in the upper left-hand corner of your screen, hopefully you can see um, that we do have another webinar coming up next Friday. And that webinar, it, we're going to try something new and open uh, a Q&A session. So Brian Lloyd, uh, Marty Snitchen, and myself will all be available here um, and present during that, that one-hour block of time. And we will do our best to answer any question around evaluation. And um, just as always, if there are questions that require um, a little bit of research or um, you know, some input from other offices, then um, we will most definitely get back to those questions through an expanded Q&A um, or through personal conversation. And I know Brian is doing his best to respond to some of the questions that were specific to the student growth um, component of this calculator we shared today. Um, and I just wanted to mention uh, before we say goodbye that we will follow this webinar up with an email to all participants, including the recording the presentation deck, and once again, our expanded Q&A document, including all questions from today's session and providing expanded answers when questions warrant more detail than what we could provide in the chat box today. Um, so if you're interested in um, 
and checking out any of the answers that are being built in right now into the Q&A. Um, you're more than welcome to stay online. But we are going to say goodbye at this time um, and shut our microphones down. And I'm going to jump on the Q&A and see if I can't help Brian answer some of these questions. Um, thank you so much for joining us today. And please do not hesitate to reach out and use us as a thought partner or a resource. Um, I know this is evaluation season. And I know people are um, nervous and just want to do uh, the best they can. So um, please consider us a resource here at OET and um, know that we are here to support you. Thanks again. If you're still live with us, um, I, did, I failed to point out that in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, there is a link to our end-of-course survey. And we would really appreciate your feedback, because specifically, we are asking through that survey, it's less than 10 questions, and it will take less than five minutes of your time. But not only are we asking for feedback on how, um, how our webinar uh, went for you today, but also um, we're asking for your feedback on how we can meet your needs this summer through further uh, webinars. Um, if there is a better day or time than um, Friday mornings, we know that some, some folks go to a, um, a 410 model for the summers. And um, we just want to, we would like to get some feedback from the field on how we can um, best meet your needs throughout the course of the summer. So please take a minute, if you would, and click on that and of course, survey link. And we will also include that link in our follow-up email to all participants. Um, but if you're still online and you want to take a moment to do that, we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much.